I just posted that we're going live on our Facebook. Wow. Do some tourist stuff. Okay, guys, and we're live. So, uh, as usual, we're live streaming these guys. Um, and welcome to Cape. Uh, for those of you who are new here or who are watching for the first time, um, Cake is totally donation-based, and the basic idea behind it is just to uh, give a series of talks and then workshops afterwards um, that will cover really practical ways that you can improve your business and um, hopefully just get a lot done in a lot faster time and make sense of this whole confusing business world. Um, the emphasis, too, is on... Um, kind of low-cost ways to bootstrap um, along as you go, um, and not so much on taking uh, funding or taking investment um, or loans. Um, and feel free to donate if you haven't already. And uh, same online. We just got our online donations up and running. And this week, we're going to be talking about testing, uh, which we've talked about a little bit um, before. Mainly just in passing, though, and kind of uh, in early tests you can run. And this is going to delve a little more in depth into it and talk a little more about uh, the basic premise behind testing and why you should do it and why it's good for you and uh, what you can get out of it and kind of what kind of actions to, taste that, uh, to take based on the results of those tests. Um, so uh, the basic summary is just that testing is really <coughs> good. Um, it's easy, it's effective, and it helps prevent a lot of stupid d decisions and mistakes that you can make along the way. Um, the basic outline uh, of things that we're going to cover, um, just a few kind of bullet points uh, to get you guys going before we delve into the larger talk. Um, test fast and test often is a really good policy. Uh, don't think that you need to spend a lot of time uh, planning these out, especially as you kind of get the basic structure. Um, you know, doing dozens or even hundreds of tests in a day is not unreasonable. Uh, Asking questions whose answers will actually affect your answers, um, uh, whose answers will affect your actions, I mean. Um, so if you have something that you're testing, but it kind of doesn't matter how the test turns out, like maybe you shouldn't have tested that anyway. You know, it's like, oh, it turns out slave labor is way cheaper, but you want to go, you know, and not do that. Uh, you probably shouldn't have tested that because it doesn't affect any kind of result that you can actually make actionable. Um, Keep your tests as close to real-life behavior as possible. Um, so surveys are not as good a test of whether someone's going to buy something. Um, getting people to actually like whip out money and try to pay you before you tell them that your product doesn't actually exist um, is a much better indication. Uh, defining your stopping criteria with tests so you don't just keep going forever, don't keep going until you hit the results that you want and then stop there uh, beforehand. Uh, writing out what you'll do with your results before you run your test. I find that's a really important one. Otherwise, you're testing things, and you get to the end, and then you're like, OK, well, I have these results. I guess uh, I'll just, I'll just kind of keep those in mind as I go forward from here. Um, and actually knowing what you plan on doing before then really helps a lot with that. Making experimentation as, pass as passive as possible is hopefully tied into how you're already doing your checkout or tied into some other process that you have. You can just include a test layer on top of that, whether it's something that someone fills out as they're buying something, some other piece of required information they have on a form, just something else that you ask them when they're checking out, or just even the position of retail in a store where you're positioning something, uh, just so you don't have to spend all of your time running this test. Once you, once you actually design it and set it up, you should be able to walk away from it and have it run in the background until you have as much data as you need to continue. Uh, Looking at the data that matters to you, it's also just really easy to get lost in like an abundance of things that you can collect and analytics that you can collect from all types of sources. And taking action immediately, once again, once you know what the results are and once you know what you're looking for and you've found an answer to your question, actually making that actionable and doing something about it is the most important thing. So uh, going back just to why we should test in general, uh, tests are pretty crucial, and uh, if there's one piece of just repetitive business advice I hear from all of the books and all of the entrepreneurs that I trust, it's that eventually you turn to testing, and then your kind of life just kind of changes and gets a lot easier. Uh, and you can start them without taking very much time. You don't need to know a lot of uh, uh, statistics and a lot about the actual testing process in order to just get started running simple ones. Uh, coupon codes, for example, are just a really simple method of testing things, and that's why they were invented, was to be able to track ads um, and see which ads were more effective. So you just throw a different code on each anything and see what comes back to you. Um, 
different ads that have different websites to go to. We've talked about that before too. Like even on just physical posters, you can put different domains and have traffic redirected there, so you can see which posters you have for like a live show that's bringing in more interest and bringing in more people just based on who goes to which domain. Uh, and there's other tools too, which we'll get, get through a list of them later, uh, like Google Website Optimizer. Uh, you can run A-B tests really easy and just change the content of websites uh, that you're running and see who interacts with them in different ways. Uh, they make sure you know which programs are working and which ones are a waste of time, which is really important because uh, without tests, it's just based on subjective opinion or based on what you feel is right. Uh, and uh, you also don't have to spend as much time in like going into projects that aren't producing that much yield. And uh, conversely, uh, you can just drop projects that are floundering and that aren't doing well. And being able to cut things out is really important. Otherwise, you just get kind of attached to everything that you're doing. And you have no idea when to call it quits. And having um, actual testing criteria and being able to see, like, oh, this is taking a whole lot of time. It's generating not that much money at all or not that much in terms of customers or not that much in terms of PR or whatever it is that you're trying to get. Um, they also prevent needless stupid arguments, which is actually my favorite thing about uh, starting to do more test-driven uh, just business development and float on, which is I've gotten in so many conversations with people where we'll just argue back and forth and be like, well, I kind of think it should be done this way because of this, or I kind of think it should look like this. And eventually it just comes down to who's better at arguing or basically like who's more determined to get their way, um, which is actually a fine way to make decisions as it turns out, is uh, just arguing until like one person is like, fine, like I give up. Because, you know, at least then you don't have to, I don't know, be bitter about it, like a decision is reached. But it's so much better now to just be able to say, well, why don't we test it? Like, okay, you think that'll bring in more customers and more people to the web page? I think this, like we can just actually do a test and see. And then there's no need for arguing. Um, and like, th we're scientists, so we have the scientific method. You know what I mean? We might as well use it. Uh, which is all I have to say about why to test. Um, moving on to the bulk of this, it's just talking about how we should run testing. So uh, hopefully, I mean, you are convinced that running small tests is the way to go. Uh, also, as long as you're just doing anything, setting up your retail or putting up signs or trying to sell a t-shirt, make a new t-shirt design, uh, you might as well just do two of them or try running mini colors of your bumper stickers or try anything since you're already setting it up. And after that, you start getting feedback. And it's beautiful because you can start adapting from there. Um, dangers of testing, not thinking that you have enough time. It really is easy to set up basic tests. Um, I mean, once again, even just choosing several different colors of t-shirt and putting those on display and seeing who's attracted to which one is not that hard to do. Uh, tracking things in your head uh, is just inaccurate. Human beings are really bad at that sort of thing. Uh, we just have a lot of built-in faults <laughs> that are related to running, like leading a hunter-gatherer life, and not as much to analyzing complex large amounts of data. That just makes our um, gut instincts, once we've been around the field, actually like really trust trustworthy. But in the beginning, especially when you're in the startup phase, probably not that reliable at all. Um, and don't be intimidated by, uh, by testing either. You really don't need to know statistics. Um, Another danger of testing is just actually kind of on the opposite side, which is getting caught up too much in a lot of the little things, um, which is just a little warning ahead of time. Um, know what you want to actually run your tests on so that you don't end up digging too deep into like, little side categories that don't mean anything. Like Once you have all this raw data and once you start learning testing methods, it becomes really enticing to use all of it. And you're just like, OK, well, now I can draw connections between gender and all of these things and see how it relates across time. And what about the month of May compared to the month of February when you like track across age? Like, What happens there? And you really can get lost in a lot of these things, which can provide you useless in, or useful information. Um, but for the most part, you're looking for very large effects. So getting lost is also not the best thing in the world. Um, <coughs> focusing on vanity metrics, and we'll talk about a little bit about how to avoid those and not on important ones. Um, so vanity metrics is just a term used to describe uh, forms of measurement that don't actually relate to how well our business is doing. Um, so number of likes on your Facebook page is a good indication of vanity metrics. Um, number of hits on your website also is a good indication, like because number of hits just tells you nothing about your actual ROI, how many people are clicking through to do the action that gets you money or gets you subscribers or gets you whatever it is that you want. Uh, so focusing on raising those vanity metrics is something that a lot of people get completely lost in. Um, also focusing, another one that's not, a, not as obvious a vanity metric is just overall numbers 
for whatever it is you're trying to reach. So if your sales keep growing month by month, uh, or your number of customers, or your number of members, or whatever it is grows, uh, but it's growing linearly, so like in January you had 20 members, and in February you got 20 more, so now you have 40, and in March you got 20 more, and so now you have 60 members. Um, if you're looking at the number of members total, you can really get lost in that easily and say, oh great, like our members keep going up, this is wonderful. Um, but your batch metrics are not actually improving. Like month by month, any changes that you're making to your actual business is not having any effect on the number of members that are signing up. So if you're actually trying to test different um, price points, for example, or like even different areas that you list your pricing or put your retail or like where you put your membership sign up on your website, um, month to month, if you're doing those tests and changing things and all you're looking is the t at, at is the total mem num members, it's just completely wrong. Um, and if you've been changing your prices and you're staying at those 20 members per month, that should tell you that price had absolutely no effect on membership. And those are the important ones to look at. So setting aside a specific batch of time and comparing it against other batches of time and kind of doing it in these small chunks is another fault that people get lost in. Um, just not designing good tests in general. Um, an important part of this, and it's just kind of the basis of all of this, is the need to be falsifiable. So if you have some kind of hypothesis or something that you're testing, this is just kind of basic science here, um, so we won't go over it too much. Just make sure that it can be disproven, that there's something that can go wrong in the test, or not wrong, but that can happen in the test to prove your hypothesis wrong. Um, starting small and uh, getting used to it is another, uh, another thing that makes a good test. Uh, just being able to actually uh, launch into your really fundamental premises. Um, you know, if, you, if your plan is to start a mailing list and get advertisers to sign up for it and, um, you know, give money that way and you're going to release a list of events, for example, like um, one of the uh, companies here was going to do, um, making sure that you can get people to even sign up for a mailing list is an important one. Um, making sure that you have uh, software that can pass spam filters is another important uh, supposition in there. Making sure there's even advertisers who, once you have that mailing list, are willing to sign up for a spot on it. And all of those can be done and tested without ever releasing your first mailing list, just with a few phone calls even, or talking to people and seeing like what levels of subscribers you need to get to before they're willing to buy an ad in that space. Um, so actually getting down and, you know, the instinct starting that might be like, oh, well, let's start into launching like headline design and see who opens the, the most headlines with this sort of response. Or let's get into content and see like what types of events people want to go to. Um, but there's so many weird suppositions that go into even like before we get to testing those, just the basic, basic premises. And so starting small is another thing I'd really encourage you guys to do and taking it like a level back even from wherever you think you want to begin testing. Um, Whoa, whoa, what happened here? Just got completely lost in here, okay. Um, and um, having an easy place to log your tests too. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, further down, but just making sure that you, as you go along, you have an intelligent way to collect your data and that you're not going to be overwhelmed with the process um, because everyone's busy running small business and testing is just this added thing that you want to do on top of that and you want to have it drive a lot of your improvement but you don't want it to take up a lot of your time so if you don't have intelligent ways to collect your data at least for me like I just it get, get, gets ignored like if I'm writing it down with pen and paper I have to pass it on to employees who are then going to write down the same information pen and paper wise and then I have to transfer that onto an online spreadsheet like I guarantee it'll just get written down in a notebook somewhere and abandoned and like a week later we won't be collecting data anymore and the entire test just gets completely ruined um, and that's just bad planning, and I've run into that a lot of times, too. Um, so actually having a good place where it automatically logs ends up being important. Um, so the next step is just the actual structure of doing this whole experiment thing. So we're going to talk about what to do before you start testing, and then what goes into designing your experiment, and then what goes into running it, and analyzing it, and then responding is kind of the, uh, the path of action there. So before you get started, and apologies for kind of breezing through a lot of this stuff kind of quickly. Um, some of it is just basic experimental method, scientific stuff, which you can look up. And there's also just a lot to get through. Um, unfortunately, we have a recording too. So hopefully it gives you a nice overview of the entire process. And I'll answer any questions at the end. But I might go a little fast. So yeah, just uh, apologizing in advance. Um, so write down your question is a good, a good place to start. Like, what do you want to know? And state it really simply. Um, once again, don't test things you don't care about. 
Um, like a good example, and I can't remember if I gave this in an earlier Cake Workshop or not, but it's just one of my favorites, um, which is Ricardo Semler, who runs Semco down in South America, um, which is this huge manufacturing company that he just started running 100% democratically, which is really interesting. Uh, and there's tons of great stories that come out of there. But one of them was when he took over, he had um, these metal detectors that people walked through when they were leaving the company, and they did basically security checks to make sure people weren't stealing tools there. And uh, he just thought this was preposterous and took out all of the uh, detectors and the checkpoints. And uh, then the employees started complaining because they wanted, like, things started missing. You know, once a week there would be some tool that disappeared. And the employees wanted the, um, uh, the head workers to know they weren't the ones stealing things. And so they were like, no, put the security checks back in place like we want these here. And Ricardo Assembler was like, no, like, I'm just going to write off the loss from those tools and call it OK. And we're not going to put the security checks back in place. And I think that's just going to make for like a better work environment, more productivity. And he ends the chapter by just saying, like, and did it help productivity? I have no idea. Like, I didn't test it because I didn't, like, it didn't matter. I just refused to have a workplace that had these security checkpoints. Like, it was not something I wanted, um, which I thought was just a really intelligent way to end that. was like, it didn't matter, like, to him if he even lost productivity on it. Like, he just did not want to own a factory that had crazy security <laughs> checks that you had to go through as a worker. Um, and so the moral of that is just make sure when you're running your tests that you're actually willing, again, to respond to the results that you get. If um, the end result of your hypothesis isn't met is that you make some action that isn't in line with what you want to do with your business, just do whatever felt right and whatever you wanted to do and recognize that's just how you want to run your business and test something else that can actually, you can change to make improvements. Um, about making a basic hypothesis, um, yeah, once again, if you're going to sell things via mailing list, make sure you can get people to sign up. Um, make sure you can attract the right people. Make sure you can convert to sales. Um, nothing's too simple to test at first. And um, once you decide what it is you do want to test, just write down your hypothesis. Uh, write basic scientific method once again. Just what do you think will happen? Like, here's your question. Here's what you think is the answer to it. And then you get on to designing your test. So um, some basic testing things, and apologies if this is a too simple review um, for some people, but uh, for some hopefully it'll be just a nice refresher in um, how this applies to business as well. So control and experimental groups. Um, just like anything else in a business test, you want to make sure that you have a control group, which for most things, um, since what you're testing is going to be um, spread out over time, like you're going to be kind of running a test over chunks of time, um, unless you run a website where you can run tests in parallel. Uh, but in like if you have one retail store, you can only kind of test one of your groups at a time um, So your control group is just going to be what's happened so far, right? Like without making any changes What are your current numbers or your current sign-up rate or your current whatever it is and that will just be your control group um, So really all you have to design then is the Experimental group and the experimental group is whatever it is that you're changing if it's t-shirt color then uh, You know the different colors that you test of t-shirts um, for sale are your experimental groups or if what you're testing is one t-shirt color versus having like five of them. If what you've been doing is offering one t-shirt color, that's your control. And switching to five is your experimental. And you just check the numbers of sales on those two. Um, Cross-sectional versus longitudinal. So that's where you, the, the difference in that basically is you either have many stores or you have one store. You either have one website where you're changing like but low, low enough traffic where you're just changing something and then seeing numbers over a week and then changing something else and seeing what happens the next week or running all of your tests at once. So cross-sectional is when you run tests all at once, but over many different groups. So you know, making it so that you're, you're A-B testing like five different things on a website, and each person who goes to the website has a one in five chance of hitting one of those pages and just tracking conversions across all of them. Um, or, yeah, once again, changing one thing on the website, letting it run for a week. Um, and for most small business owners, the thing, or with uh, low traffic on a website in that case, the thing you'll be doing is longitudinal studies. So you'll be testing over time and then changing something and then testing over another period of time and changing something. And that's just kind of the nature of the beast. When you don't have a huge amount of people coming in you don't, or you don't have a huge amount of stores or something where you can test all of these different variables, you kind of just have to limit it to longitudinal. Um, sample size, just how big your study is. Uh, in general, the bigger, the better, right? The more times you flip a coin up and down, heads and tails, um, the closer it'll get to 50-50. And it's the same with all the other statistics that you're bringing into. The huger amount of people that you're testing, uh, the more likely it is that you're getting accurate data. Um, in general, a good, uh, a good thing to go by, less than 20 is a really dangerous number to have. Um, around 100 starts getting like, decently safe for sample sizes for groups. Um, and above that is awesome. 
Um, and it depends on how, so, and another thing with sample size is the smaller the groups, uh, the larger the effect size that you're looking for has to be. And the uh, larger the groups, that's when you can get in, hone in and test some like really small effect sizes of small changes that you're making. Right, so Google have changes like tests out 50 different shades of blue back 10 years ago on their website to find out what the best blue was to have their link color be and posted the results. That's like a really minor change, but spread out over the billions of people who use Google, it ends up being fairly massive. Um, biases and eliminating those ends up being really important, like especially in business ideas, right? Because it's our baby and we have a good idea and we're like, okay, great, I think this is gonna bring in so many more customers. And the instinct then is to just actually, well, I mean, I guess the instinct is to like tell one of your employees to go do that then, um, or to go do it yourself. Uh, but rather than launching, you should say like, okay, well, what's a simple way that I can take this back a step and actually test early on if this will fulfill some of my hypotheses, if this will bring in more customers, if I can get people to sign up for a basic mailing list. Um, and um, because we get so attached to them, we just have to be aware of things we can do to kind of counteract that. So um, two really simple ones are experimenter bias and um, uh, well, yeah, I guess, and that's the, I guess it's just one. Experimenter bias was the main one I was going to say. Um, and then the two things we do to correct that are, uh, oh, I guess, an experiment bias was the other half of that. Um, and so those are blind and double blind studies is what we do to protect against those. Um, so the idea being if a customer knows what is going on and that we're running an experiment on them and what that exact experiment is, that they might have an opinion on what we're doing and change their actions to suit what they think the outcome should be of the experiment. Um, and same with us as experimenters, which I think is actually the more dangerous one in running a little business experiment, like when you're changing a retail display or changing signage, like in addition to like switching that signage around, whenever someone comes up during the week that you've changed the signage, if you really think that it's great and better and it's going to help, you're basically going to just lie to yourself and say, no, I'm, yeah, I'm just talking to people the exact same way I always talk to them, but you're gonna like smile a little bit more. Or you're going to like, you know, maybe look down at the sign a few more times than you usually do when you're giving a speech or than you have been in the past. And it's a really hard thing to control for. So um, ideally what you do is you make it a blind study, which in business is relatively easy. You just don't tell someone that they're going to like a version of the web page that someone else isn't going to, right? Um, you just throw it up there and they automatically go there and they never know the difference. Um, and in the website it's nice because the website is objective and it doesn't talk back. Um, in a retail space, hopefully you don't tell your employees about the test that you're running or you don't tell them what you expect from it um, and you just kind of set it up and do it and that way you can run a type of double blind study and see what happens and the idea of double blind is just neither the um, experimenter nor the experimentee knows what's actually going on with the study they just kind of know what they're supposed to be doing um, running batch experiments we talked about this a tiny bit uh, so Comparing across similar periods of time or groups of people, um, not looking at overall numbers again, that was that like 20, 20, 20, like an increasing membership, um, but not having it change at all how many members per month are brought in. Um, also running small batch experiments is a nice part of this too. Uh, <coughs> running your experiments just in really small sections um, can be really useful. So um, saying like uh, one day, I'm just going to change the wording on the sign and see what happens. And then the next day, I'll change the wording on the sign again and see what happens. And the next day, you know, exact same thing. Um, and that's just once, like, uh, and I guess the emphasis here is on making this really simple and approachable, hence, like, things like changing the wording on sign. Like, that's not something that's that hard to do. And if it can yield actual significant results, right, if suddenly sales go up 25% on an item or um, whether online or in person, that you just, like, changed a little sign headline on, like, that's great. And if it does nothing, then you know that, that sign probably was doing nothing, right? Like even a nil result tells you that something is going on there. Like if you can just change, like if you can just take off the headline altogether then, and that doesn't have any effect on sales, and then you just like take down the sign, and that also doesn't change sales. It's like, okay, maybe I just need a sign up there, right? Um, either way, it hopefully yields to, uh, or uh, yeah, it lends itself to results. Um, okay, so starting simple. Um, we know now about controlling experiment groups, so deciding what's your variable. Let's go with t-shirt color, for example, um, for that one. So just saying, okay, I want to see what t-shirt color sells better with like the float on t-shirt design, for example. Um, how large do you want your study to be? Okay, well let's just like 
uh, you know, we can run it a few different ways since we don't have that many people who buy retail and float on. Um, let's do see like amount of time that it takes to sell 20 t-shirts of each color and just run it that way. And that way we're also guaranteed not to waste money on the t-shirts um, running different colors and uh, just running it for a set amount of time. So it's like, okay, we'll just run it until it runs out of stock, like 20 t-shirts of each color. And so then we just print them and start running one at a time different colors and seeing how long that takes to run out of stock. And if something like obviously sold, like if the first one sells out in a week and then the next one takes, you know, three weeks or four weeks and still hasn't sold out all of its things, I'd probably just switch to the next color, right? Like our, um, we're not trying to get raw, crazy empirical data here that tells us absolutely like these colors will never sell well. As soon as we have something that's performing well, we can kind of drop the other colors for the sake of speed, right? Like, <laughs> okay, great. Like, a neon pink is not doing that well. You know, it's been four weeks we sold two of them. Like, okay, let's just move on to the next one. Um, how can you run without wasting much time or money? Hence, like, the idea of tw uh, 20 t-shirts, maybe even 10 t-shirts sh or five t-shirts of each color, right? How long does it take to sell those? If you don't even have that much money, um, even having just an option on an online site um, asking, t telling people that they can choose a different color and then being like, oh, sorry, we're out of that one. All we have is gray and seeing which ones they choose or putting up some kind of forum on the counter and asking people, you know, saying, hey, we're thinking about getting in colors. Do you have any requests for a color of a t-shirt? Might be another simple way to run that test that doesn't even require buying shirts in the first place. But once again, and the next part of this is getting as close to actual behavior as you can ends up being really important. Uh, just being able to actually um, see what real life interactions they're going to have with your product and with pulling out, once again, their wallet or with giving you their email address ends up being really important. So um, having the t-shirt actually up for sale and having them pay you money and giving them a t-shirt and they walk out with it really is where you want to be with running a test in that case. Um, getting someone to fill out a questionnaire and say like, oh, like if you bought this color t-shirt, I'd totally buy it. Like they won't actually buy it. That's not, that's not true. People are really bad at self-reporting their own behavior. Um, we just get so excited sometimes. We like filling out forms. It's very confusing for us. Um, and once again, collecting data as you go. Um, the nice thing about actually selling the t-shirts in the store over different periods of time or until we run out of them is you're collecting that data like you have in your system when you sell those t-shirts, as long as you're bringing it up as part of your cash register. Um, and that you don't have to change anything. Like all you've done is put up the t-shirt and ran it in a different color and done. Like every your just automatic logging system of your cash register takes care of the rest. Um, and so once again, the next important thing is just planning before testing. Um, before you get into actually running it, now that you have planned out what you want to do for your test, um, know what you actually want the results to dictate. Uh, so if the case is that we're selling way more of one color t-shirt than any other t-shirts, does that mean that we don't want to offer other colors or does it mean we want to just offer different colors but print a ton more of that one color and have change our ordering policy rather than our supply policy? I don't know, you know, that's a decision to make. Or maybe what we actually want to test is if then that color, once we know that it sells well, the next test might be put it up next to two other color t-shirts and see if that sells better than having it up there by itself and base that decision on another future test and have it inform that. Um, but deciding whether we're going to run another test or make an actual decision beforehand based on those results just saves us a lot of time in the future. And knowing what your results uh, can possibly be is also important. Like, oh, none of them sold different. It's like none, the color didn't matter at all is one an option knowing what you're going to do then, which in that case, it's like, okay, well, I guess just print colors that we think looks ni look nice <laughs> and that we want to have up in the shop because nothing else has any effect on it. Um, or if one color is cheaper than another, I guess going with the cheapest option might be another one in that case. Um, and then for each possibility, just write out what you'll do. Basically, just make a little spreadsheet column of possibilities. Usually, there's not more than like four or five significant ones and write out what your actual business response to that will be. Um, running your experiment, uh, really simple actually. Now that you've laid it out, uh, you basically just do it. <laughs> um, and do it by the books, just follow your outline, exactly what you wanted to get done. Um, and don't, oh yeah, here's a big one. Uh, don't worry about the data as you go along too. And this is a trap that's really easy to fall into with website analytics, with, with following your Facebook likes, with so many different things. Um, it's really easy to waste time doing that. I talked to one guy who worked for, um, oh gosh, what was it? Um, one of the big internet startup companies back in the day and uh, was just saying how uh, at one point their stock was going up and was just like doubling every three months. And it was insane. People were buying really fancy cars and like losing all their money and just spending a lot of time watching the business go up. And then after a while of that, it just suddenly like crashed down. 
and he blamed it on the fact that people were just paying attention so much to the success of the business that they weren't paying as much attention to what was going on internally inside of it and their own actions. Um, so can bias you as one part of it, like in addition to just not being accurate, like watching data as it comes in and the numbers of like individual sales as they're coming in. Uh, I mean, it's like you're running a test over a period of time and waiting until you get these like groups of sample sizes of 20 for a reason, which is data is way better as it averages. So you're not going to get an all an accurate view of what's going on by watching it as it comes in. And it wastes time and it can bias your own actions. Like if things aren't going as you want them to go during the course of the experiment, you're probably going to change something. Or if you're the one working the retail counter, there's a danger that you just take that into your own hands and change your own actions. Um, Try to set it up as passively as possible running the experiment too, which is just another time saver. Um, you know, so you can set it up, walk away, and come back when there's data. Once again, that's that automatic logging through selling system. Um, Google, um, Google Analytics for websites is great. Uh, so is uh, um, Google Forms for collecting information is really nice. Um, that's through Google Apps, like the Google Docs and everything like that. Um, you can just set up, actually through Google Docs, you can set up a form. Uh, that'll just show up on a website and you can fill it in, it'll automatically save to a Google spreadsheet which you can then share with anyone and run an analytics on and things like that, um, which is a really powerful tool. Um, so then we get into analyzing your experiment and I think this is where a lot of people get kind of intimidated and especially on low level tests like we'll be running, they really shouldn't. Uh, so there are crazy analytical statistics out there, there are things like uh, p-values, which is the probability that, uh, that your results are due to chance, um, which in general you want a p-value of less than 5%, so like there's less than a 5% chance that the results you got were due to chance, which you won't even worry about running for now. If you run into those, that's what it means, so you guys know. Um, there's like crazy multivariable analyses, there's meta-analyses to test like across many studies and see like what form of studying something produces the best results. Um, ANOVA analysis, the analysis of variance testing to see like how much yeah, craziness is going on basically. Um, so first and foremost, just pay attention to what you want to know. Like you had a question going into this, and that's how this whole thing started. And you had a hypothesis about how it was going to turn out. So paying attention to that and what's going to happen ends up being really important. Um, in business, and this is the other part of it, especially starting out and with not that many customers coming in that you're um, actually selling to, the effects that you're looking for are going to be big effects. Like if your effects aren't big, then they're not really going to affect your like your business. When we're talking about millions and millions of kind of like people going through your website every day, then yeah, like small things that only affect you know one percent of people actually have a significant change. Um, if you're doing something like ours, where even you have um, now about a thousand people coming through the float space every month, um, that starts to get more significant. You know, if we can do like even a five percent change in how much people sign up for memberships that ends up being a significant number of people. Um, but 5% is still like a pretty significant change in the scope of like psychological experimentation. A lot of stuff early on too is going to be more into like 10 to 20. A lot of A-B testing early on before you've dealt with a lot of the big stuff yields things like 50 to 150% increases in a lot of um, traffic and just changes in um, overall sales and retention. Um, just because you're tackling some of the really big things like, oh, should I make this button that's down here in the bottom right-hand corner and just like every other like giant and big and in the center of my page and see what happens. It's like, sure, yeah, let's do it. Let's see what happens. And lots of times making a button really huge actually just does make it click to like 150% more often. <laughs> um, and so you don't really need complex statistics to see that change of effect. Um, it also means, yeah, once again, you don't need to worry as much about the complex stuff. Hopefully those things that really stand out are going to be the things that you want to change. And even though you can get nitty gritty and really dig into those analytics and dig into the things that you're doing and find out what's going on, um, you probably don't want to because the obvious things should be obvious and those should be the ones you're changing first because they're producing such like sore thumb, stand out, like pay attention to me kind of changes in your metrics. As you go along, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. like what happened there? And that's where you want to be making your changes anyway. Um, by the time you get down to the point where you're dealing with the like lesser insignificant effects that are also happening, like you're going to be so far along in your testing career to have tested so, so many more things. It's just absurd. Um, yeah, and just um, in general also know, I guess, the, uh, the more you know about analysis, just the stronger your tests will become as well. 
Um, it's not only good for digging into the details. Like once you know how to run the analyses and what you're looking for, the more you can be like, oh, I'm just going to throw a little gender box on this form because then I can factor that in like much later if I do want to see the effect of gender on this thing or whatever it may be. Like the more you know about running the test afterwards, the better you can design it to begin with. Um, and so I really do encourage you too to go out and learn more about statistics if you don't know um, that much about it and about um, running tests. And uh, website metrics, uh, make it really easy to learn about a lot of it now, fortunately, which is great. And um, online just allows for crazy massive amounts of testing. You know, like there's um, tests that will actually just figure out how long like they're, like track their cursor and how long it's spent over different sections of the, the page and like how far you've scrolled down. Compare that in like to where they were funneled in from and different metrics from that. If you're tying into Facebook analytics and things like that, you can check across gender and all types of different things for the people coming into your site. Um, so learning more, um, a couple books that I recommend, um, Halo Effect is a great one, um, just a great business book to start with in general. Um, it's all about business fallacy, um, one of which is a Halo Effect basically, um, and more just logical fallacy, but it kind of just tears apart a bunch of business bestsellers from the last like four decades and talks about why the books are um, totally ridiculous and don't actually tell us anything we need to know about business. Uh, and The Lean Startup is uh, another really good one, and I keep recommending that one, but that one especially for this uh, is great. It talks a lot about batch testing and a lot about how to run intelligent uh, tests and make sure they don't just take over your life but tell you important things. Uh, good sites to go to, Marketing Sherpa is a really good one. They're incredibly test heavy. Um, Khan Academy is another great one just for learning in general about statistics. Uh, that has everything from like basic uh, middle school level statistics up through you know crazy college level statistics uh, and everything in between. Uh, nice tools as well to end there is uh, Google Analytics works really great for websites. It's a good basic one to start with. Um, Google Web Tools lets you do A-B testing uh, really easy on websites. Uh, I mentioned the uh, Google Forms too for collecting data. That's just beautiful because it automatically sorts it into a giant spreadsheet for you that you can do whatever you want with. Um, and then um, as far as if you want to, if you end up uh, running a site that is more prim um, primarily online and is more based um, on these really complex metrics, uh, there's two that I hear tossed around a lot and I haven't um, tried them personally, but they pretty much seem like the highest two recommended, which are KISS metrics and Chartbeat um, are two really powerful um, website metric sites. So that's pretty much it for testing. Uh, the summary just to go over that again, uh, the same thing I went over at the beginning, is testing is really good and easy and simple and you should do it. Uh, <laughs> test fast and often. Uh, ask questions whose answers will actually affect your actions. Um, keep your tests as close to your real life behavior um, or to the real life behaviors of your customers as you can. Define your stopping criteria. At what point do you just say, okay, great, I've got enough data. Uh, write out what you'll do with your results before you run the test. Make experimentation as passive as possible so it doesn't end up eating up a ton of your time. Look at the data that matters to you and then take action on it immediately. Once, you've, uh, once you know what you want to know, you know how you're going to run the test, you know what you're going to do when you get the results and you get those results, like, great, just do whatever it was you decided and actually take that action is what I wanted to leave you with. And so that is my little whirlwind tour through some of the more basics of running tests to improve businesses. Uh, so. Okay, hope that, yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, guys. So if you have any questions um, immediately, feel free to shoot them up, too. Um, otherwise, I'll answer a few questions after we take a little break and come back for the workshop portion of this, which should actually be fun. I think we'll just design a good test to run for one of the businesses and workshop that. Uh, any questions off the bat, though? Um, I'm kind of uh, working on this event um, with a couple other people. We just kind of been formulating the ideas behind it. Uh, the other day we capitalized on what we were you know, able to think about, but there's a lot of questions that are coming up about um, who to target for the event, uh, what sort of, uh, it's, it's more sort of like a networking event, so mm -hmm. we try to bring in different people from different network, uh, different business types, different disciplines together, and find out you know, how to collectively get them to uh, connect with each other and communicate and try different ideas. Um, so kind of a question I guess I have is more, so how do you test something of like the, the event itself before you do the event? Um, 
That's good. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess it depends on what, what is it that you want to test or what do you want to find out? Or well, what? as the end result, we want to have uh, people from different disciplines gather together to try different things uh, together and um, come up with kind of like a, a, an alternative thinking process or, you know, working. So you have people from different disciplines uh, collaborating, essentially. And, uh, uh, who, who would be best working together, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that, sort of, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Um, so, I mean, there's a few different things in that that you might want to go and test, too. Um, like, I mean, one is just that people would want to gather from different disciplines and meet for something like that. Right, that's the first question, is like, whether, you know, how, how to get them to gather together and how they'll communicate and those sort of things, I think. Totally. Um, and the good thing, too, which um, I didn't cover, like, uh, getting to asking the right questions or which questions you want to know mm -hmm. um, is another whole process of this. And, um, like that one, figuring out uh, yeah, what you want them to work on, right? Like, what will get people to gather together? Mm -hmm. um, Money. <laughs> uh, not, not always the case, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, that's a, like, if, so that's not, that's not going to be your question and hypothesis, right, necessarily. Um, right here, uh, here's, like, a primary question, which is uh, generate new ideas through cross-pollination. So that's sort of, like, a goal towards uh -huh. it. So, um, I mean, trying to figure out, like, questions to ask or ways to, you know, figure out how people would generate the best results through cross-pollination. Yeah. I mean, one thing I was thinking about is that potentially a test has already been done by other people who try sure. to do this. So yeah. go out there and actually cull from all these other you know events that have happened. Um, you always think you're doing something for the first time, and then you find that 50 other people have already done it in different cities. Right. So I, I would scour the internet and see other people who've done this. And a lot of times, given the nature of what you're talking about, they'd probably be pretty free with the information to tell sure. you what worked and what didn't work. Right. And there are probably some uh, blogs about how they went about it, how they uh, properly you know, coordinated. Yeah. That's the, I think, the biggest thing is about coordination based on like uh, running this event before running it, you know, like testing it out, like the environment around it. That's true. And um, I mean, yeah, that's where best practices come into play, too, um, and the idea of those. So um, best practices are kind of where you start, right? You um, do research into the field or whatever it is that you're trying to launch or, um, you know, get people to sign up for. And then you do that through what other people have found to be really successful in similar projects or in similar fields, right? Like when you're designing a website, you don't just throw the link off in the bottom corner, like below the fold, right? You know that if you want people to take action, you throw a kind of main action on the front page and make it simple, and that's just the best practice. Mm -hmm. For some websites, though, like weirdly, it may turn out that if you just throw that link over in like the bottom right-hand corner below the full fold, for some reason, they're like less pressure to do it, and like they end up taking more action there, right? And these weird like um, independent cases you don't get except through testing. But yeah, a good place to start, especially like on number one of something that you're going to do event-wise is to start with, yeah, the best practices and start going from there. I was thinking to um, testing it in smaller um, chunks before we get to like the bigger event itself. Testing yeah. it, like smaller groups to see. Yeah. I suspect if you go if you go to like LinkedIn for example, you'll find people who put together events that are kind of similar. I would think, and so. then they would be willing to share more likely than they have written it up on a blog or somewhere where you passively would get it. But like yeah. they would be very responsive to. I mean, think about the type of person who did that, right? Yeah. Like you reach out to them directly, and you're like, hey, look, I want to do this. You could probably flip out, I don't know, forty of those, right? Yeah. Buy the premium service for a month. That's eight, that's eight a good 40 point. people. Yeah. See yeah. what they come back with. Four of them are going to be like. Uh, I'm not really think what you're up to. It doesn't really work for us. Yeah. We'll put you in touch with three or four people who like came to their event, and then you can talk to those people and be like, "What what happened for you there that would bring you back?" Yeah, what worked, but what didn't work. Yeah, that's what was the experience that you had there that you were like, you know, it was like taking a nap, right? Because you get to cross pollinate. And that's you had your best creative idea for three months. Yeah, and yeah. Maybe that resonates with people. That's that's like, cool. Oh, yeah. So yeah. uh, people I think will probably tell you if you reach out to them directly. And like you said, I would be very surprised to find out it. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, I think it's been done to some uh, uh, effect for sure. Nothing's <laughs> original. Totally. Um, did that answer uh, your question yeah, a little bit? Super helpful. Nice. Um, anything else before we hop into break mode? Yeah, I was thinking about just the most basic variable in my business. I make it sell lip balm is the price I sell it at. Um, but it's difficult to test because. I don't want to sell it to get it into a store and wholesale it at a different price for each store. Mm -hmm. So I came up with the price when I started, and it was just kind of like intuition and like how much it costs to make it, how much I want to make per tube, 
what do, where do I think the sweet spot is in like selling the most the most volume? You know, what do I think the best spot is? And I just kind of guessed at it. And now I'm set at the price that I started with because uh -huh. I'm in all these stores and that's my wholesale price. And I kind of want consistent for every store. But how do I? It's possible that selling it for more is going to make me a lot more. It's possible selling it for less is going to make me a lot more. But it's it's a rigid. I'm kind of in a rigid structure because I don't want one sort of like, hey, you're selling it to this guy for, you're selling it to this store for way less than you're selling it to me. What's up with that? Or, hey, why are you trying to charge me more? Like my friend, you know, a lot of people know each other. Uh -huh. for this. Um, so I feel like I'm in a tough spot and I also feel like I need a lot of data to, to, to determine if one is, one price point is better than the other. And there's a lot of variables involved in, Comparing this store versus that store, yeah, this store sells for less, but this store has a lot more traffic, and I just have a hard time figuring out how I could actually successfully. Totally. And it's the most important data point for me, I feel like. So, I don't, do you have any ideas? I'd say go to Saturday Market for a month and change your price each week, up it by a dollar or something like that, and you, you probably won't be selling to the same people each week, mm. so it's not like they'll be looking at you. But yeah, get, you can get a booth at like a Saturday Market, yeah, yeah. Okay. Or, or something like that, where you have like temporary places and you sell it direct. Right. Okay. And, and if you need to be, you know, geographically disparate, you know, then go up to Olympia or something. Or I mean, Saturday stuff. Market like last Thursday too. Last yeah. Thursday, great. I think the yeah, Saturday Testing Market time. last Thursday test ground is like actually a really good thing in Portland for sure. Yeah. Even that though, like in Portland, you, it's going to be even variable just on the weather. You know, like maybe the, maybe this Thursday was 70 degrees and this one was 55 and rainy. Like mm -hmm. probably regardless That's true. of what you're selling it at, you're going to sell a lot more on That's 70 degree day. I'm um, you, you, I'm guessing also people like if they, it's branded, right? It's not like you're selling it and then people wrap it up with their own. Right. And so like once someone buys it, if they like it a lot, then they're like, oh, this is the best freaking lip balm I've ever had in my life. I want to buy more, right? Yeah, so like, what if you went to like a Saturday market kind of a thing and you get people with a little sheet that says, hey, look, I'm here just this weekend because I'm from out of town. It doesn't matter you lie about it. And then if you really like it, I'll sell you five of them for this price, right? And then you can vary it and be like, when they go and they take it home, they put it on for three or four days, they like the way that they kiss, then they they, they send you an email and they say, yeah, we'll buy five of them. So what percentage of people actually know the back and want exactly. to purchase it? Because then you're getting a sense of better maybe of like, what, when, when someone goes to a store and they buy it, and who knows why they buy it, but they buy it because they like the look of it or whatever. Sure. And then, but then how much are they going to pay on an ongoing basis? Right. It's going to be difficult to get a large of samples. Like I'm going to want at least like, 80, a lot of people calling back to make that order at a bunch of different price points to figure it out. But that's but kind of what, like, what you're you saying go. is that like, at, the, at the beginning of that stuff, it's like, if you get like three people, that's probably huge. You know what I mean? And yeah, but with three people like can't make any type of judgment on okay, which price is more effective. If it, I, I guess, I, I would guess that early on, if you try, you could, you could double the price and that, you know, have it. And that you get a really good sense, like. I see, we see some big changes. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. It's like the, the, a big effect. Right. And then, I think this is great. I didn't even think of like when I'm reta retailing myself, I can change the price a bunch. I'm not stuck into my like, wholesale customers. So thanks yeah. for thanks for that. Uh, that Maybe you can find a retailer in another part of the country who would be willing to test for you. I, mean, I was going to say, yeah, that's the other two thing too is just taking completely out of this market and testing some different prices. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's tough to compare it to here though because it's called Portland View Balm. <laughs> a lot of the people that buy it is just because it's. Just it's <laughs> so, yeah, that's. Or if it, yeah, or if they can test it, then, all right, thanks, yeah. <laughs> oh. um, and then there was one more too, which is, uh, that I thought of, which is releasing just another really similar product, right? Like also having a bee balm and just saying like, with, you know, crazy citrus flavor, like, you know, whatever. Um, and just charging either more or less for that item. You know, just changing something Maybe small about it. something different so it's not competing awesome and kind of test. It's the same quality product, but you're testing it under a different name. So now yeah. see the price. Yeah. Maybe just change the name. So we call it special blend. <laughs> change nothing. Change Charge more or less for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it does, that is also another thing without diluting your own product. Also just slapping another total like brand on it and making your same product and just calling it something completely different. And um, yeah, trying to sell that too is not a terrible thing to do. Even like a lot of stores, especially if they're local ones, might not be against that and just say like, hey, trying to figure out like, you know, some different experiments with different formulas and didn't want to compete with myself or like change my main thing. Do you mind if we just like set this up, you know, next to my display and so, you know, have some of those and something like that might work. Yeah. It's, it's 
funny, it's called Portland bomb. Portland bee bomb. No, it's funny, I, it, the biggest thing you might find out is it has nothing to do with the price of the product, it's the uniqueness of it. And you might come up with like, you know, weird colors or flavors and different names and like, and sell it for each city. And that might actually, so you're, you're studying in another city might be almost, yeah, lead you in a completely different direction. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, I think we're going to call it quits for there. Um, and then I'll answer any more questions when we get back from break. Um, slash, just kind of toss them to the group too for feedback, which is really the way it goes. And then when we get back, we'll just highlight a business, do a little workshop, and design a test for it.